You are listening to the Two and Out CFL Podcast, a proud member of the Canadian Football Podcast Network. I'm Travis Curra with Sheldon Jones as we wrap up week 16 of the CFL season. I'd like to say that the playoff picture is getting clearer, but I I don't think it is. One thing's for sure. Maybe if you're a Stamps fan. Yeah, that's true. Or the Alouettes. Uh, they do have a home yeah. playoff date after their victory over uh, the Ottawa Red Blacks. But let's just get right into this thing. The Hamilton Tiger Cats beat the Toronto Argonauts 33-31 on Friday Night Football. That means the Tie Cats have swept the Argos in the season series for the first time in five years. But now they're five and nine on the season. Uh, the Argos are at five hundred seven and seven. This was just a great football game to watch. Um, Bo Levi Mitchell was dialed in, and I ran into Mike from the Podski Wee Wee uh, podcast at uh, Commonwealth Stadium uh, for the Elks and Bombers game. He says uh, the Tie Cats are the best five and nine team he's ever seen, and I'm uh, inclined to agree. I mean, is Bo going to keep wearing those coveralls? Because that seems to be what's doing it for him. Uh, honestly, I think he, like, just with how par- like how everybody's so similar and the parody across the league, I think you could say a lot of teams are the best, whatever they are, whatever. Uh, but, yeah, the, the, the Ticats are hot right now, and... Uh, Honestly, like there's been some chatter on Twitter this week about MOP uh, candidates and stuff. And I was kind of having a little back and forth with somebody about because uh, I said probably Bo out of the East still because he's playing. He's still leading the league in most of the categories. And the guy's like, oh, can a guy who's been benched win MOP? And I was like, was he benched for performance or was he benched just because his coach didn't like him? Like there's a. There's a, there's a difference there, but yeah, no, the Tiger Cats are doing awesome, and and Bo, he's he's come back and he's shown us that he's still able to to compete and to to thrive. Now, this obviously week seventeen is going to be critical. The Lions are struggling. The Tiger Cats play the Lions, um, BC coming off the bye, and then the Argos play uh, the Alouettes. Um, so <laughs> look and and. Uh, the way the Argos performed a few weeks ago against the Lions, completely different than what happened here against the the Tie Cats. And the big difference, if you want to compare the Cats and the Lions, is probably the the O line, the protection that Bo has had. He he looks as good as he ever has. He's got so much time back there, and some of the throws he was making, it he he doesn't look. Like, there's any pressure on him. He's just out there playing like the old gunslinger we used to know. And look, yeah. they're four games under 500 with four games to go. But if the Cats make the playoffs, <laughs> I would say Bo might deserve uh, MOP consideration, which is crazy because Chris Jones was fired. Bo Levi was benched, and now they're having fun together in Hamilton. And look, the defense is forcing turnovers. Bo's throwing touchdowns. This is just wild to watch. Yeah, and like I understand that there's this uh, stigma attached with most outstanding players or MVP awards in, in sports leagues that the team has to be like you know a dominant team for this player to win the award, but. It's just most outstanding. You can be an outstanding player if the team doesn't win games. Uh, like, if if I had the vote right now, it'd be between Bo Levi and Roland Milligan. And I don't know who wins between the two of them. And both teams are sub-500 right now. Uh, so, <laughs> like, this could be the first... Like, I don't know if it's the first time, uh, but this could be a year where two teams play in the Grey Cup with sub-500 records. Like, any team... Right now, other than the Stamps, has a chance to go to the Grey Cup, I think. Just the way that they're playing uh, within, like, I think the wheels have fallen off the Stamps. But even even the Elks, they didn't play great this week. 
Yeah. Well, they kind of they played they kept Winnipeg in check and then they collapsed. But um, I think any team right now can beat any other team except for Calgary. And watch Calgary come in and just go on a tear now. But, Prove you wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's happened a lot. Believe me. <laughs> and I think for this game between the Ty Cats and Argos, I th- I think one of the defining uh, things in the game was was the penalties uh, and the, and the timing that the Argos took the penalties. Actually, there was a. Uh, uh, it was that roughing the passer. Now, uh, some of these calls were ticky tack. We don't need to discuss that, I guess. But well, uh, but but if you're gonna like if you're gonna call other players for getting like having their momentum taken away and getting into a players' legs, then this had to right. be called the same way. Like That's it's true. dumb, yeah. but it had to be called. Yeah. Had that, that was the first one, and it did lead uh, to Hamilton's first touchdown. And let's face it, uh, Hamilton got into that field position because of uh, the Stavros Cats and Tonus interception. So, <laughs> in a game like this, and it was a great crowd at BMO, and I understand that a lot of Ticat fans were there. I could hear the Oski yell loud and clear on uh, TSN. So they were there causing a scene, and it did look like a great atmosphere. And I know the field was definitely presenting some challenges because uh, it was getting chewed up. There was a soccer game just two games, two days before this one, and it, it looked, I guess, kind of soft, you know? <laughs> and players are yeah. slipping and things like that um but yeah. then the argos answered back and they had a touchdown drive of their own this really was just a back and forth affair and when it came down to the very end of the first half the tie cats got into a little bit of penalty trouble themselves they actually scored the touchdown but uh bordner on the old line ends up taking a face masking penalty of himself and then on the next play takes a procedure penalty so the tie cats did have to settle yeah. for three at the end of the first half but uh and, and this would come back later in the game the the argos you know let the tie cats drive down the field and and score points late in a half late in the game and they couldn't really stop the tie cats the tie cats i mean there were there were kicking field goals but uh, there wasn't much punting going on for the black and gold on this evening no it was just a like a, sh- a classic cfl shootout game uh and and that's you know i I, I can appreciate a good defensive struggle every now and then, but I love an offensive shootout just because it's exciting. You don't know what's going to happen. And it, it basically comes down to whoever's going to have the ball last is going to win the game. And, and that's what happened. I'm looking at the Ticats drive chart and they actually punted the ball uh, three times. Uh, their last five drives were touchdown, field goal, field goal, field goal, field goal. Uh, I know they, they probably would have liked to score more sixes, but um, the, the fact that they were putting points on the board and they were killing the clock on the road, I think they're happy with that for sure. Um, now, in the second half, the Argos have a lead here and... Then the Thai Cats on their second possession of the half, a big play to Shamar Bridges, a beautiful throw, uh, that 45 yarder that uh, I think he ended up being out at the seven or something like that, two or whatever. Lee Trey gets the ball, it's a touchdown. And then Toronto goes back 11 yards on their next possession. And then what a wild possession that the Thai Cats had next. They're up by three. They (laughs) get the ball down to the goal line and they get stuffed three times in a row. Now, on third and one, I don't know about you, Sheldon, that was just a weird play call that the Ticats tried. They get stuffed, but the Argos make the worst mistake you can probably make in football, and that's be offside as a D-line on third and one. The Ticats get three more opportunities, and they still <laughs> can't punch it in. So the, the Ticats go 48 yards and eat seven minutes of clock. That was one of the wildest drives I've ever seen, but that goal line stand is what kept the Argos in it until the very end, really. 
Yeah, there there has to be something in that field, in that stadium. I don't know if it was the same end, but let's go back to the Riders and Argos game when the Riders stuffed the Argos like five, like right. three times and turned it over in this game, right? So uh, it, something, <laughs> some sort of aura in that stadium. But yeah, it was it was crazy. I was... I. I'm not a Tie Cats fan. I'm not an Argos fan, but I was yelling at my TV like, "How can you screw this up?" Like, <laughs> it, it was just incredible. And then, and then to settle for a field goal is just so demoralizing. Like, like I get it. You're still getting three points on the road. They ended up winning the game. Great, but like, like that's just got to be <laughs> like. Wh- where is your your confidence in your short yardage team after that? It's just brutal. This has to just destroy Mil- Milanovic Litre's uh, yards per carry average. Oh. Now <laughs> he's in there on sneaks, but here's how it reads: mm. He rushes for zero yards. He rushes for zero yards. He rushes for a one yard loss. He rushes for a one yard loss, and he rushes for another one yard loss. So five carries for minus three yards. <laughs> For Ante Milanovic Litre. Uh wow. That 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 was one of the craziest sequences I think we've seen uh all year. And then I, I kind of wondered if it was gonna unravel for the Ty Cats, but uh they 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 keep it together and the Argos eventually do take the lead uh in the fourth quarter when Chad Kelly makes that big completion to Devaris Daniels, 66 yards. It just it, it was one of those plays where it looked like the Argos of last year, um, where they can just make these big plays at will. And they did take a 28-27 lead. Well, uh, the, the Ticats do what they need to do. They've been moving the ball at will, and they, they kick a field goal. Toronto kicks another field goal, and then Hamilton gets the ball back with 56 seconds to go, and uh, they kick the winning field goal at the end of the game. But th- that fourth quarter, there was action. It, it Left and right, I know there were some dramatic penalties here and there. There was one called back on a challenge, which was a great challenge. The, the receiver just kind of fell in the end zone there, but... <laughs> Ticat fans, like what a roller coaster of a year. And I know the odds are still long to get into the playoffs. Um, but more performances like this. And they, they just might get there. Like this this season has told me do not doubt anything. Mm-hmm. But and even if they don't make it to the playoffs, I think this is great. This is a good um a good thing for Taika fans just to see that uh, maybe what Scott Milanovic has been doing and, and and the dish that he's cooking, maybe it just took a little longer to make. Uh, I know there's been some questionable player personnel decisions. I've criticized some of them, you know, Bo Levi and, and Butler. Um, but, you know, they're starting to go in a roll. And I don't know if it's just the coincidence of Jones getting there and, and the defense, which was the problem early on getting fixed. And, so maybe it's a little bit too little too late for that. But at the same time, if they can take this momentum as they're getting finishing off the season here, realize what pieces they need to keep, then they have the building blocks to hopefully, you know, come back next year and and start stronger instead of starting as terribly as they did. Yeah, it's the holes you dig at the beginning of the year. I know they say the season doesn't start until after Labor Day, but if you don't start playing until after Labor Day, it is uh, a little too late. Bo goes 31 of 40 for 362 yards and a touchdown. James Butler back in the lineup, 11 carries for 58 yards. And Bo ended up finding eight different receivers. Uh, the leading receiver was Shamar Bridges, six catches, 82 yards. But Giovanni uh, Robinson is the one that got the touchdown from Bo, four for 49. He's a big target. I'm sure Bo's going to enjoy throwing to him for uh, the rest of the season. If we go to the Argos, 17-26, 255, a touchdown and a pick for Chad Kelly. Um, And I still don't think that they're probably running the ball as much as they would like to. Uh, Kadeem Carey only had seven carries, but a great average. 9.3 yards a carry, 65 yards on the game. In what was the 69th game of the season, Sheldon? Nice. Yeah, so nice to have an entertaining one for... uh, (laughs) 
that game of this. I just had to throw that stat in there. I couldn't, I couldn't pass it up. Um, if you would have, I would have been upset. <laughs> Mark Leggio, six for six, man. Uh, on field goals. I remember it wasn't long ago when he, he, he seemed to be struggling in Winnipeg. He had some rough games and they wanted him gone and he, he's doing pretty well in Hamilton. Blink. So good to see. Good to see that. Now the back half of the Friday night doubleheader was the Saskatchewan Rough Riders in Calgary beating the Calgary Stampeders 37-29. And the story here is really that the, the Stamps just cannot stop the run. And if your team can't stop the run, let's face it, every team in the CFL has the ability to move the ball through the air, uh, maybe not always consistently. But if you can't stop the run, you can't stop anything. 248, oh, 244 given up on the ground. It was 248 through the air uh, for the rider offense. So just physically destroying them. Raquel Armstead, 8.3 yards a carry, 25 carries for 207 yards in his first start for the green and white. Uh, just physical dominance. Other than the very first drive, touchdown Tommy. Uh, ooh. Has a 69-yard rush (laughs) for a touchdown uh, right off the beginning of the game. And then after that, uh, the Stamps didn't do do much until the second half, really. I was so upset watching that, but I still was just like, nice. (laughs) (laughs) Like, I was so rattled when I saw him run. And then then when, I think it was Dustin Nielsen, he's like, a 69. I was like, oh. (laughs) <laughs> uh yeah other than that like honestly there was that and then there was a uh, like i know calgary's offense kind of came came alive in the second half there but um yeah Saskat- like honestly like this what i said last week happened the riders needed to commit to the run and if they did that they could be successful and they did and you know for rack armstead to come in and there was a lot of questioning the signing there was a lot of rider fans online who were you know, quite opposed to it, not understanding why it happened. And and I guess I'm not saying that this is, you know, proving them wrong. What I'm saying is sometimes people deserve a second chance. And when they get it, good things can happen. He just had the fourth best rushing yardage game ever for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders in his first game. That's just, that's unheard of. Um, he reminded me a lot of Corey Sheets, uh, just the way that he could hit the whole hit the whole fast, but also make cuts and and you know spin off, bounce off. But what a game for him! And and you know what? I honestly saw it. the Calgary players were trying to egg him on. They were trying to get him to uh, to try to you know get off his game and to get maybe a misconduct or whatever. There's one stamp player who landed on him well after he was tackled, and you know I didn't I don't understand why there wasn't a penalty called, but he was able to keep his cool. Uh, he had a teammate help him, uh, but uh, next week is going to be a big test because, you know, he's playing his former team, and uh, it will be very interesting to see how that goes. Yeah, that that is going to be a good battle because, uh, look, Ottawa's rush defense is way better than Calgary's. Uh, their D-line uh, is very physical, and you know there's going to be some talking happening during that matchup so that one is going to be uh one to watch there and look (laughs) there was a lot of not so flattering stories coming out about him when he got you know cut from ottawa and maybe that is a wake-up call uh for him i i really don't see either bob dice in ottawa or Corey mace being guys that will put up with that so it was probably spelled out pretty clearly when they brought him into Saskatchewan. I mean, uh, sometimes you take the good with the bad. I mean, <laughs> we've talked about that a lot in the CFL this year. I think you know what I'm referring to. Uh, but, uh, yeah, once they start costing your team penalties and misconducts like was happening in Ottawa, he got let go. And so far, uh, to Saskatchewan's benefit, 
some rookies getting, uh, you know, onto the field for the Riders. Adjo Adjo has a catch. Dell uh, Duncan Busby has a catch. He is 34 yards. But Keyshawn Johnson, uh, the rookie American receiver for the Riders, six catches, 90 yards. I mean, th- I mean, one of the plays nice. should have been a little bit bigger. But Sam Emelis, I know 15 years ago that is just celebrated as a great block by a receiver. But in this one, yeah, it's one of those back to the line of scrimmage things. You can't do that anymore. But uh, it did take some yards off the board for Harrison Johnson. But I mean, it is football as well. Yeah, I think it's it's hard for a player to hold up in that situation, especially when you're when you see that player looking as vulnerable as I they know. are there. Yeah. Um, but you know, the the penalty that it is what it is. It, it had to be called, I guess. Uh, there was one that I felt was missed in a later game, which uh, we can kind of talk about that. But yeah, uh, it. Sad news though, because it looked like a Joe Joe got hurt, mm. uh, and he he that's why Duncan Bigsy got in there. But it, uh, from reports I hear, I heard that he was actually carted off at wow. the end of the game. So uh, that's not looking good for who what could have been the Riders Rookie of the Year, maybe. Um, but yeah, next man up there. But you know, it it Duncan Bigsby was able to get in there and didn't seem to miss a beat. He he. He looked wide open on that one catch he had there, and he I saw some good blocking from him too, which is what a JoJo has been uh, used for primarily this season. Now, there's an interesting article that came out on 3downnation.com Sunday. Uh, I think J.C. Abbott put it together, and who uh, reports that the Calgary locker room was uh, not a good place to be after the game. Trey Roberson... And uh, is it Coatney on the D-line? The, the rookie defensive lineman had to be separated in the locker room. And clearly, I mean, you give up over 240 rushing yards in a game. Uh, that That's going to wear out anybody. And now uh, the, the performances after Labor Day here, the, the stamps have just completely imploded. And it's clear they're not working as a team. And they've got talent. I don't think anybody can d- deny that. Like what I found interesting in the article was guys like Reggie Bagleton and Mark and Michelle just basically, you know, ripping apart the young guys. You know, they're not here to play Stampede or football. They don't want to be accountable and things like that. And those are guys that have had success. I, I, clearly that locker room is not gelling and after one year now this is a team that's been in the playoffs for basically two decades in a row do do you see them making big changes this offseason or or is it just going to be sort of a reset a reload or however you want to put it after the year Uh oh Well, I think they kind of have to make big changes because this, you know, they were able to slip into the playoffs last year solely because the Riders couldn't win a game after Labor Day. Uh, And this year, it would take a miracle for them to make the playoffs now. Um, I think, like you said, they have a good core group uh, of veterans. And very interesting in that article where one of the players said that (laughs) – this is a participation uh, trophy type of players coming into the league now. and that It was they, weird. They, he said it's a generational gap. Yeah, so, like, but, I mean, other young players on other teams are doing well. So, Yeah. I, but that's the thing. Like, I just don't know if, if Dave Dickinson is the type of guy to be able to wear both those hats of head coach and GM. And maybe uh, I know – There's been lots of rumors that eventually the succession plan would be Dave moving upstairs and just being the GM and, uh, you know, the Mark Killa maybe taking over as head coach. So maybe that gets uh, sped up here. I don't know. Um, But something does have to change. And whether it's a culture thing, whether it's a – these players need to understand whether they need to do some more bowling, team building. I don't know. Uh, 
I, 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 and I'm not even really saying that as a, as a jab at Craig Dickinson. I'm just saying like, if there is like that much dissension in the locker room and, and I don't know if it's that the, the coaches have lost the room. I don't know if it's only just the players fight in fighting with themselves. Right. But there has to be something. There has to be some sort of team building there. And and I say bowling is, you know, to get a little pop out of you and, and that's fine. But they <laughs> like they need to work on some sort of team building. There needs to be something to bridge the gap between those two generations that, you know, the players Bagleton, Bagleton and, and Roberson are talking about here. Uh, because if nothing changes we're going to get the same results next year. And we're already seeing stamp fans who have uh, been able to cheer for a perennial winner for 18 seasons, making the playoffs. And now they're going to miss the playoffs. And, and it seems like some of them are like ready to abandon ship. And it's like adversity happens in in sports fandom and and as a writer fan i i know a lot of it uh in my 39 years here so that's that that happens it's just that this fan base has been so lucky that they've had such success and someone's gonna like, suck i mean yeah and it's kind of like at the beginning of the year when the the bombers started out sucking and there was lots of people who were upset and, and upset at the fact that they'd lost the last two gray cups in a row. And, and it's just, it football, like there's a reason that there's games played in football and it's not just teams or winners every year. So there's only one winning team and there's uh, yeah. the rest are losers. And uh, yeah. sometimes I, I wonder if making the playoffs can just be like covering up the band-aids or you sure. know, just yeah. putting a band-aid on it. Cause last year, Playoffs at six and twelve, like all right, <laughs> that wasn't going to yeah. make the playoffs every year. That's definitely outside of the norm, and I guess they really didn't improve that much. They, they maybe reg- 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 regressed. Wow, I sound like a toddler. Regressed. <laughs> uh, I don't know why I couldn't say it, but <laughs> here we are. Uh, I mean, the stamps ran for almost 200 yards themselves, too. Of course, 69 of them on one yeah. play, and uh, Diedrich Mills had 74 yards on 10 carries. So they did have success running the ball as well. But again, it was one of those things where they dug a hole in the in the first half, and they just couldn't get back. They almost did. They, they were <laughs> down by five and, you know, they're going for that two point conversion and the, they got stuffed uh, by the riders at the end of the game. And then Jameer Thurman making the interception at the end of the game against his old team to seal it. Um, what was that play call, though? Like, yeah. It's third and one. And an, you have almost Tommy a minute Stevens. and a half left. Like the only thing I can think of is that Dave Dickinson got in his head too much about the amount of time it would take to get his short yardage team onto the field, run the play, and get the short yardage team off to the off the field. That's the only thing I can think of because, you know, to go back, like I love the rec laws, I love, but third and one from the gun is not a good strategy, not at all, and 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 yeah, it's like Thurman kind of. I don't know if he baited him, but, you know, Mayer obviously didn't see Thurman there or he just didn't get enough under it, and and that's game right there. Uh, but you bring in Tommy Stevens, and he probably gets that yard, and it could be a very different story. Can I read your tragically hip piece? <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, so Sheldon and I are in a, a chat, and, uh, well, obviously... <laughs> And he goes, poor Stamps fans, they're so hard done by. So I reply with a gif of the late, great Gord Downey. You can check out the new Tragically Hip documentary, No Dress Rehearsal on Prime. Did you watch it? It's I'm, I'm two episodes in. It's so good. So good. Like tears, laughter. It's It's amazing. So Sheldon responds with, Stamps fans were just looking for a place to happen to jump off their bandwagon. Maybe they could find a gift shop in Bob Cajun that sells little bones that they could use to help them get some 
courage to realize that they might have been ahead by a century in the CFL's West Division for so long they were blowing it at high dough. Put down the three pistols and put away the fireworks. Now that is good. That is good. Uh, Because they might as well start cheering for the Wheat Kings as their playoff chances are like New Orleans is sinking. Last year I was 38 years old and I was hoping they were going to miss the playoffs. But this season is like my music at work. It's finally going to happen with Grace 2. Man. Bravo. I did that in about five minutes too. Encore. Encore. Oh, um, I can't do it on. I can't do it on encore. <laughs> but watch, is... watch the documentary and sorry, Stamps fans, but uh, not sorry. <laughs> Four, nine, and one at this point of the season. Uh, still above high 500 at home. For, all of their losses and their tie uh, did come at home uh they are now last in the cfl as the tie cats are five and nine uh the riders uh, of course this win was big for their uh playoff destiny uh they are now only one point back of the bc lions uh for second in the west with four games for each team to go uh we go to saturday <laughs> this was also a uh, an entertaining game. At least I was entertained. It was only 24-12, but I was in an Edson hotel room and uh, enjoyed watching the game. The Alouettes beat the Red Blacks 24-12. Again, the story here is interceptions and turnovers. Um, Drew Brown's calling card so far has been his ability to protect the ball. And he goes 8 of 16 for 69 yards, Sheldon. Nice. With two interceptions. And then he ends up uh, leaving the game with an injury. And I I do wonder if we are going to see uh, Jeremiah Masoli start to come into play here. He might be starting against Saskatchewan uh, with this injury here. But uh, now the Red Blacks... They had surprised a lot of people. Now the Argos are right on their tails, even though they did lose to the Ticats. But uh, yeah, first looks like it's no longer an option for uh, the Ottawa Red Blacks. But now, yeah, struggling a little bit. And when you can't protect the ball, uh, you're not going to win many games. Just ask Edmonton, which we'll talk about next. Yeah, uh, it's it's been crazy the the ebbs and the flows of the season and and the the peaks and valleys for certain teams. Uh, you know, three four weeks ago, Ottawa was one of the hottest teams in the league, uh, and then now they, <laughs> you know, it's like they can't buy a touchdown, they can't buy a a, a a series without an interception. It's it's. It's kind of baffling. <laughs> Again, this season has just been so crazy, and it's whenever you think something is trending a certain way, something happens and takes it away. Uh, but they were playing Montreal. Montreal is obviously a, a, a great team, and I, I, I know I said that this was gonna be <laughs> going to be the East final preview. Uh, I don't know if I'm so confident in that anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's tough because I, I think Drew Brown is a really good quarterback, and I think he's shown why he was a highly prized uh, asset in the quarterback room for, and why Ottawa went out of their way to trade to get him. Uh, but, you know, he's getting – learning curve for a year as the first year as a starter and he has a guy like Jeremiah Masoli who can step up and step in and and you know he he did well the first time he did that but this this time not so well uh I don't know it's it's just it's it's gonna be interesting to see how how Ottawa can can re- respond to this adversity that they're they found themselves in Yeah, the first uh, score of the game was a pick six. It was Deontay Ruffin of uh, the Alouettes returning a Drew Brown pass all the way uh, to the house in this one. And then the next series, 
Drew Brown throws another interception. And yeah, it was in this game where uh, Tyler Sneed gets called for that crack black crack back block. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Sheldon. So he got called for it, uh, but there was <laughs> there's another play later in the game where. Uh, a Montreal offensive lineman definitely came back like five yards towards the line of scrimmage. And he didn't, he didn't, you know, completely take somebody out, but he definitely impeded them. And there was no call on that. And that like is <laughs> legitimately way more of a crackback in my opinion. So I thought that was quite interesting that these, it's almost like, Oh, there's a huge hit and it could be a crackback. Cause I think this, this need one was less, it was less of a going back towards like it was more lateral than I think the Emilis one was. Um, but it just seems like because it was a big collision type of a play that yeah. they're more likely to throw the flags instead of one that wasn't a collision, but definitely impeded the Ottawa defender. And it led to a pretty decent gain for the Alouettes. I, uh, <laughs> I don't want to keep talking about this command center stuff, but uh, so the Tyler Sneed, uh, it's incomplete to him in the second quarter. They call pass interference on this one. Ottawa challenged it. I thought it was pretty weak as far as pass interference goes, but they let it stand. Uh, and then I think it's just because there was a jersey grab. Like I think that's the reason. If it, I don't think it impeded him. Right. But I think it just it just looked like he was grabbing like this. So I think that's why they couldn't overturn it. And then Sneed was also involved in a couple series later where Montreal challenged uh, to have pass interference and the play ended up standing too. I just I just thought <laughs> both of them were, to me, obvious. And I guess at this point, it's just like, why have challenges on it? Like, if those things you were calling at the beginning of the year, and now you just stop, what's what's the... Like, if I'm a coach, I don't even know if I'm confident of challenging anything at this point. Yeah. I agree. This is a little off topic, but kind of in the same. Did you see what happened in the Calgary Dinos game this weekend? No. What happened? So, last play of the game, throwing a, throwing the ball, the receiver caught it, for a touchdown, but they called him out of bounds. There's no video replay in U Sports. On replay, he was definitely in bounds. Ooh. And they lost the game because there's no replay. So there's a lot of people who are like, take take away replay. So I know. How, how do we feel about a team legitimately losing a game when they should have won if video replay is there, as opposed to some stupid, re some stupid reviews getting you know, maybe not the right review. It's, yeah. it's such a, such a, a, a weird balancing act. I guess um, it becomes sort of, uh, <laughs> how do you decide what's obvious and what's not? <laughs> Cause some well, people will say, they, well, that's obvious. And they say, well, yeah. not that obvious. Well, it's, it's because <laughs> it's because biases there's biases. Yeah. And so fans especially have bias. There's, there's rider fans who, think that certain things aren't right there's bomber fans who think a certain way there's stamps fans like it, it, like every single fan base but when you have a neutral party or a party who's supposed to be neutral in the referees and the video review people you would think that they would be able to have some sort of understanding on what is clear and obvious but they need to review it they need to do an overhaul i know they sent out a statement and gave some lip service halfway through the season that they're going to just be doing clear and obvious, but they need to go back to basics here and hopefully they can figure out a way that they can make it so that we don't talk about them as much next season. That pass interference one that did get called uh, on uh, Ottawa did lead to an Alouette's touchdown and that got them, I, I believe it was a 14-3 lead at the time there. But uh, this Alouette defense, when they are on, it's just very difficult to come back on them. In the third quarter, Justin Hardy had a nice touchdown catch from Jeremiah Masoli and at that point it was 21-12. Uh, 
Nice, nice. We always appreciate the the rush references there, um, and uh, they couldn't c- uh, convert on the two down second point. <laughs> Two point conversion uh, for the Ottawa Red Blacks there, and then yeah, they just can't get back into the game uh, with the Alouettes. They're just a tough team to figure out, and when that defense is rolling, well, good luck uh, getting rolling uh, against the Alouettes. Sankey, he had uh, six tackles, and Tyrese Beverett, he's having another one of those years, man. Two tackles for a loss. Uh, two on special teams, seven overall tackles on defense. And then Wesley Sutton had a game. He had a sack. He had two knockdowns, five tackles himself. And actually, Mustafa Johnson is a bit of a menace in the uh, defensive line. And they were causing troubles for Ottawa because Addy Emmy Berglund had a sack. Johnson had a sack. And Johnson had two. Two knockdowns himself. So uh, the, the Red Blacks, they, they just had a tough time dealing with uh, those physical alouettes. And they came to play. They got it done. And uh, they've been playing playoff football since the middle of last year. And they've been able to keep that intensity up all the way through most of uh, this year. And yeah, they're just an impressive team, man. And Kalen Laburn, he gets the start at running back for the Red Blacks. 13 carries, 71 yards. Uh, Justin Hardy, the leading receiver for the Red Blacks, 117 yards on nine catches. Uh, And Jeremiah Masoli, he goes 17 to 26, 218 with a touchdown. As for Cody Fajardo doing what he does, uh, 16 of 27, 226 yards, does not uh, turn the ball over there. And uh, their leading receiver ended up being uh, Charleston Rambo, four catches, 77 yards. That is that game. And then there is the Bombers and the Elks game where it's 3 nothing Winnipeg at halftime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Edmonton could not move the ball. D- do you... Uh, clearly the Bombers came in with a great game plan. Jordan Younger and uh, the Bomber defense, their early season tr- struggles seem to just be gone. Uh, th- they are difficult to deal with. Trey was having trouble with Willie Jefferson. He had a knockdown. Uh, he chased, he was in the backfield uh, all over Trey a couple times there. And he goes 10 of 17, 131 yards, two picks. And there was the touchdown at the end of the, uh, or sorry, at the beginning of the third quarter there. But. Ugh. They couldn't sustain anything in the first half, and that probably clearly wore them out uh, a little bit there. And then once they got some momentum, I believe the Elks had an interception on Zach. They're in good field position. They're pushing the pile, and they take that unnecessary roughness penalty, and I think that killed some momentum that the Elks were having as well and I still don't know if I saw unnecessary roughness on that play I'm being honest yeah I don't know either um it, it you could just tell they were getting frustrated and maybe I uh, I didn't see it uh, and you're right I think that was the the turning point there um but it just they couldn't get anything done uh credit to them for the first half of being able to to limit uh, Winnipeg, uh, giving up those turnovers, but then not let not allowing Winnipeg to score more than one field goal. I know, you know, Doink the Clown showed up twice with Sergio Castillo yeah. there, so uh, so that it could have been nine nothing at, at halftime, but the bounces went their way. Um, but it it just seemed like like you said, Winnipeg was just ready for for everything that that Edmund can do. And that included when McLeod Bethel Thompson came in instead of Trey Ford, like they knew how to switch their coverage and they knew that they didn't have to spy a quarterback anymore. And they could, you know, just sit back there and wait for, for McLeod to try to pick him off. Yeah, I did. I, I appreciated how Edmonton committed to the run, but in the first half it, it wasn't working. Like they, mm-hmm. 
they got nothing done. And then as the game went on, clearly their commitment to the run paid off because then they were able to move the ball. Uh, Rankin had 157 yards on 14 carries. He had a 53 yarder in there. So th- th- they they were starting to able to move the ball on the ground, but they'd have these big gains and then they'd, Fumble the ball. Kevin Brown loses a fumble. Trey Ford loses a fumble as well. Uh, they had four turnovers in the first half. You're doing that in a half of football. You're right. It is kind of wild that they were only down 3 nothing at halftime. It probably should have been uh, a lot worse. Uh, but the Elks defense, they, they, I mean, they make plays. They, they lead the league in interceptions and for a reason now they they are making plays but when the offense is just not there uh to support you then uh it, it's tough to get anything done now the elks did uh start the second half well they had a touchdown drive now <laughs> that that ball that Trey threw up to Gino uh <laughs> the the defenders didn't know what they were doing uh we, I don't Tyrell Ford he didn't play the best angle there <laughs> yeah it was it was funny because in our CFL group chat I said like amazing catch and, and it, it wasn't an amazing catch anyone could have caught it's it it's a like fun play he yeah. said but just the fact that you know <laughs> Winnipeg they didn't know what they were doing uh but I bet it was actually a lot funner for you to watch the game you know not having to hear every single play that Trey and Tyrell were playing each other and that they were twins and that they were brothers and (laughs) well I was did you know that that did you know that that was happening Travis I did we sure did (laughs) and I I kept an eye on it in the first in in the stands and it looked yeah. like they were avoiding throwing that way that's what it looked like to me yeah he threw he threw one like the first play and of course it was one to nothing for Trey at that point <laughs> Glenn Suter told us that a bunch of times uh listen i i love the fact that there's twins playing each other and the the fact that there's three twins three groups of twins in the league currently uh but It just got so annoying on the broadcast. Uh, The fact that that's all they were talking about when there was 100 other players there. (laughs) Um, But back to the game here. Uh, I think think that might have played into Trey's head head a little bit because, uh, like you said, I do think that he was avoiding him a little bit. And when you're avoiding, like, because Trey or Tyrell was covering either uh, Eugene or... Uh, probably, I don't even know, Mitchell maybe. So you're taking away your two, your two, two of your best targets there if you're trying to avoid that situation because, you know, the last thing you want to do is have Tyrell pick you off, right, if you're Trey. Um, so maybe that was a way that the Bombers were able to get into Trey's head a little bit and, and another advantage that they had maybe. Yeah, and so in that third quarter... Uh, the Bombers, they start with a touchdown, so it's 10 nothing. The Elks do answer back with that Geno Lewis touchdown. It's 10-6. And then Sergio hits the, uh, hits the upright, and then uh, the Elks tie it up with a field goal on the next drive and then that big that big sack by Derek Moncrief. And I thought, ooh, the Elks <laughs> got the momentum here to start yeah. the fourth. And then the very next drive, Trey Ford gets intercepted. And from then on, it was all Winnipeg. It, it was just Edmonton had fallen apart, and uh, they they weren't going to come back from that. Even that, that when McLeod Bethel Thompson comes in, his second possession, uh, they're down ten, and that third down play where it's third and nine, and Curly Gittens runs an eight yard route. <laughs> And catches it and turns it over on downs on their own 37. So the next drive ends up in a Winnipeg touchdown. That sequence was brutal. Yeah, well, the whole series, because they, they did a they did a passing play that was incomplete. And then they tried to do a draw, which was like, I, I get that the running was working, but 
terrible time to do a draw. And then, so it's, yeah, third and nine. And then the rider fan PTSD in me just <laughs> exploded when I was watching that. Just how many times I've seen, I've witnessed the riders throwing it short of the first down on third down. And like, I just, I felt for all the Elks fans just because I've been there so now, many was that times. on the receiver? Like, don't you got to know? I, I think so, but it's it's on the quarterback too because you got to know that he's not far enough. Like, but you, you assume that, well, that's the thing. I don't know because every every play call is going to have different yeah, yeah. yardage and progression. So maybe on that little hook, maybe it was only an eight-yard hook drawn up and maybe he ran it correctly and maybe there would have been a 10 yeah. yard you know post or something <laughs> i don't know how, how i don't know how that works but you know playing madden we get to see the line of screen we get to see where we need to go when we're calling up the play but in real life like i know it's bang bang and, and mcleod has to make yeah. that that decision right away but like you know, you you got to make sure whether it's the receiver, whether it's the quarterback, whether it, it doesn't matter. You have to get a first down there, especially in your own zone, especially when you're still technically within striking distance of getting back into the game. Um, it's just it just I felt for Elks fans there. Yeah, that that fourth quarter was was all Winnipeg. Uh, Brady started rolling, and <laughs> they couldn't finally tackle. got some touchdowns. That's another thing that I don't have to hear about anymore is how he doesn't have any touchdowns. Eighteen carries, so one hundred and twenty-seven yards, two touchdowns. His first two touchdowns right. of uh, twenty twenty-four, which is actually pretty wild. I, <laughs> I I know he like, and I know that he's probably like he's got them so close to getting touchdowns. He, he has a thousand yards. He's he's definitely turned it on, and he'll he'll be Winnipeg's nominee for most outstanding player. But he can't represent the West only having two touchdowns, can he? I know there's four games left, but like that's. <laughs> I know you're starting your Roland Milligan campaign, but <laughs> I, I, I don't am. know who deserves it at this point. I I don't. But I'm I'm just saying, like, because there was there was a lot of people who were who were saying that, that he, he should be the MOP oh, just okay. because like I was just seeing on Twitter like today and yesterday, just because of the fact that, you know, Bo has been benched and that there's the injuries and that there hasn't been excellent play just because of certain quarterbacks not being able to play full seasons and some getting injured. But like a thousand yards is great. Only two touchdowns in 13 or 14 games is not great. So I'd say Stanback has overall had a better year at running back. I, I would agree with that. But I would agree. There's still a few games left. Uh, yeah. I, I will say this about Winnipeg. Like their first play from scrimmage was a big catch from uh, the king, Kenny Lawler. Um, mm. He only had two catches, 26 yards in this one. Um, and Geno Lewis only had two catches, 44 yards, including that that one touchdown. But I think there's something to be said about getting your big receivers involved early on. And uh, when Winnipeg or Edmonton was winning, Geno was a big part of that. They were getting him yeah. going. Um, and look, Curly Gittens only had three catches for 27 yards. If neither yeah. Lewis or Gittens are going... I, and I know the Elks can run the ball and they have a three or you can argue a four headed monster when everyone's healthy and Ford, Leak, Rankin and and uh, a Brown. But uh, I mean, if you can't get 87 the ball early and set that tone, what are we doing? I, I, I felt yeah. like this didn't look like a team off the bye. This looked more like the 0-7 Elks in the summer uh, yeah, to me. Yeah, but teams off the buys just aren't the same this year I as guess. teams off the buy in the past. Uh, yeah. I don't know what it is. I don't know why. This has just been a bizarre season like we say yeah. every single episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like Winnipeg wasn't dominant, uh, especially early on. They they couldn't put Edmonton oh. away and the Elks yeah. hung in there, but it was that fourth quarter when it was like, well, yeah, <laughs> the Bombers are clearly just making more plays. Uh, this is why they've been to the last four Grey Cups. They they make the plays they need to make, and they win the games they need to win, and 
this was a, a big one for them to yeah. win as they are in first place. In mm-hmm. because you look, uh, BC is four and four in their own division. Uh, Edmonton is actually four and three. Uh, Winnipeg six and three. They've played nine games, and you got to beat the teams in your darn division uh, to mm-hmm. have a good spot going into the playoffs. If you're not going to beat them, well, you're not going to get very far. And Winnipeg has been really good at that the past few years. Uh, Saskatchewan yeah. and Calgary, three and four inside of the West. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my dad actually sent me to Stanley's today, and he's like, "Look at the call. Look at the West wins, and it, it's very interesting. It goes eight, seven, six, five, four for wins. It so does. Each team has one win above. <laughs> like it's very. I, I don't recall that ever seeing that before, and uh, very interesting. And then also when I was looking at that, Winnipeg has the least points scored, yet they are. They do. First place in the West right now. And Very BC uh, got shut out in a game. <laughs> uh, <yep. laughs> sure did. Wow. Now, are the, do the Elks have to stick with Trey now? Like, they, they make this big announcement before the bye, and this game was, it was not good. Um, I don't know. It's it, but it's the same thing as what BC is doing because BC just committed to Rourke for the rest of the season. Um, I thought when they pulled Rourke, when they did, it was weird, super weird, especially with him scoring a touchdown. Yeah, right I didn't it, get like, that. half. Um, but this is the thing when you have two quarterbacks. Like you need to have two quarterbacks to win in case somebody goes down. But it's got to be frustrating for those guys, like, you know, not knowing who's going to be playing. And and it's good, I guess, for the coach to say, like, this is your, this is your team now, but Hamilton did that. <laughs> and then their guy got hurt. And then the guy who got benched had to come back in and now is winning games. So um, it's, it's just kind of bizarre. Uh, and I, I don't know who gives the Edmonton the best chance to win right now, whether it's Trey Ford or whether it's McLeod Bethel Thompson. Like, I just don't know if you can have the, if you can have Rankin and Brown and Leak cover the, the, the load in the running department, then maybe you don't need to have Trey in there. And maybe you can just go with the sure pocket passer that McLeod Bethel Thompson is, but he's had some games where he's been off too. So I don't know, but I don't know if McLeod's is good off the bench. He was a couple weeks ago, but Trey's great off the bench. (laughs) Yeah, and then when McLeod started, he was doing better. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so maybe maybe that is the way to go, have McLeod start, and you can have Trey come off the bench. Um, But I don't know. (laughs) I I honestly don't know what. Uh, They're going to Winnipeg. Like that old Fountain Tire commercial. Nobody wants to do that either. <laughs> That's week 16 of the 2024 CFL season. Sheldon, I'm going to throw uh, the power rankings up on the screen. Uh, Winnipeg remains in number one, but some big movement. Uh, yeah. Especially I, that I number three to. spot. I had to just because, you know, teams are teams are doing well so Hamilton all the way up to number three they've been riding the the back the bottom for most of the season Uh, you know they're just playing well and like like, you know if Bo keeps wearing those overalls they maybe they'll get to number two or number one who knows Uh, imagine that the team with power rankings being number one or number two and missing the playoffs that's crazy that would be Uh, actually yeah, and then Edmonton had four, you know, BC, Ottawa. Like, it's kind of like it was early in the season which is with just different teams. Winnipeg and Montreal, they're the top teams right now. There's no one can deny that. Calgary is the worst team. Nobody can deny that. The rest of the teams, you could probably put them anywhere. Yeah. I've, I've seen some some places still have Saskatchewan as high as four in their power rankings, which wow. I, have, I have no idea how that's possible because they – you know, they've just won their first game in seven. Um, but again, between Edmonton, BC, Ottawa, Toronto, Saskatchewan, any of those teams could beat any of those teams. So 
it's it, we're getting to the point where maybe power rankings are starting to not matter. They don't matter ever, but like it's just we're getting to the point where any team can do anything as long as you make it to the playoffs, right? So it's it's this is the best time of the year. Usually by this point of the season. <laughs> yeah, usually we have a lot of teams confirmed or got it pretty figured or, out. This is going to come down to the wire. Last game of the season is going to have a lot of Love to see jockeying that. for positions. Yeah, it's it's excellent. That's week 16 of the CFL season. Uh, just on a personal note, uh, and I, I know because I, I, I talked about it on the show uh, earlier this season uh, when the Jasper Wildfire uh, Complex got underway and did what it did. I got to go to Jasper on Sunday and uh, see the scale with my own eyes. Man, it's, uh, social media kind of has you prepared for it, but it all also all awesome, makes it seem like everything is doom and gloom, you know? And uh, yeah. to see the smiling faces and uh, to see the strength of the residents and to see the workers, you can literally drive by uh, workers falling trees you know with chainsaws uh you know making the roads the trails and everything safe so thank you to those uh people and then the locals uh, welcoming people back uh, had some spent some money left some money in jasper but that's uh what uh, we we like to do and <laughs> uh we'll be there again thanksgiving weekend now that some hotels are opening up but it, it felt normal and different at the same time because we love doing the nature photography and stuff like that. And man, the elk are. <laughs> I saw some nice pics and videos. Yes, <laughs> they are fired up, and they have. <laughs> let's face it, more space than they usually have, and mm -hmm. uh, they're they're certainly taking advantage of that uh, right now. But uh, yeah, got out to the Andromeda Coffee Bar. Uh, got to Evil Dave's Grill. Uh, yeah, the the people there, they're resilient, they're strong. And I know the cleanup is ongoing, but it was special for uh, Taylor and I to get back uh, back to Jasper over the weekend. It is the reason why uh, the pod's a little bit delayed this week. But uh, hey, life goes on. I thank you, Sheldon, for being flexible and uh, to and out. Uh, not a nation yet, but uh, certainly... A village. <laughs> Gee, I, I think to an out village, we might be big enough. You know, small town Saskatchewan, every town becomes yeah, a town it. when it has a subway and an A&W. <laughs> and then a Dairy Queen. Yeah, yeah. And the McDonald's is usually last. But uh, I think to an out village would definitely have an A&W at least. For sure. <laughs> and a Chinese restaurant. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and a great rink burger, probably. Yes. Yes. You can rate, review, and subscribe to To It Out on your favorite podcatcher. Join us on YouTube. Check out uh, the website, toandout.ca. You can find the Patreon links, and you can find the merch store as well. I know Sheldon is going to get fancy and maybe run a sale right away here uh, for uh, those loyal, loyal uh, To and Out nation i think we got 20 residents. 20 percent off right now for the next four days I believe. oh what a deal go take advantage of two and out.ca we will talk to you later this week to get you ready for week 17 <laughs>